Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Essential Tremor Virtual Education Forum. Today, we're discussing vocal tremor. My name is Patrick McCartney, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Essential Tremor Foundation. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our corporate partners, Medtronic, Abbott, Insitech, Sage Therapeutics, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Cala Health, and Praxis Precision Medicines, whose support allows us to provide these webinars, our podcast series, and hopefully someday soon here in the near future, our quarterly ET education forums in person. So I wanna go ahead and introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Johns. Dr. Johns is a graduate of John Hopkins School of Medicine. He completed his residency in otolaryngology at the University of Michigan. He then pursued a fellowship in laryngology and care of the professional voice at the Vanderbilt Voice Center at Vanderbilt University. He's currently the director of the USC Voice Center at the University of Southern California, pursuing research, teaching, and clinical care with a specific interest in laryngeal dystonia, geriatric laryngology, and the aging voice. He is also a longstanding member of the IETF Medical Advisory Board. So Dr. Johns, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thanks to the IETF for including me to talk about voice-related issues that can occur with tremor and dystonia, and I appreciate everyone for tuning in and listening. I have about 30 minutes maybe or so of material that I wanted to review, and this is a very, very complex topic, And uh, but hopefully this will give an overview and a sense of what's happening uh, with laryngeal dystonia and vocal tremor and what we can do about it and what the future is going to hold, hopefully. So um, with that, the title is Tremors, Quakes, and Shakes of the Voice understanding and treating vocal tremor and spasmodic dysphonia. And um, I'm sure that most of the listeners, uh, this will resonate with you if you or one of your loved ones has vocal tremor or spasmodic dysphonia. Just a couple disclosures. I am on the IETF uh, advisory board and the advisory board of the Voice Foundation and the Laryngology Education Foundation. And I receive very small royalties for my books, The Performer's Voice and Laryngeal Dissection Atlas, as well as very small royalties for my educational course that is on MedBridge on laryngeal video stroboscopy. Okay, so we're just going to start with how the voice works, because that really is core to understanding what goes wrong with the voice. And so in this diagram kind of depicts the three subsystems that are coordinated by the brain to make sound, voice, and speech. And so highlighting first are our lungs and the airflow that's generated from the lungs. This is our power source. This is where voice, this is what energizes the voice. And it's kind of like a billows. We can think of it like a billows, just producing an airstream that comes up the windpipe or trachea to the larynx. And this is the larynx. It sits here in the neck. This is our sound source or the vibrator. And it's kind of akin to a mouthpiece on an instrument. And the sounds that the mouthpiece makes is really kind of a buzzing, really kind of mechanical sort of sound. But then when you add the horn, to the system, which in us is everything above the vocal folds, including our throat, our mouth, our tongue, our palate, our nasal and sinus cavities. This is how we, our sounds are shaped and uh, allows us to do all the things that we do with our voice. So these three subsystems are coordinated by the brain in a complex way. So we're gonna break uh, these down a little bit our lungs, our diaphragm, and our ridge, rib cage act together to allow us to breathe, of course, which happens automatically, and then to generate the power for sound production. And we don't think about this much when we are speaking or when we are breathing, but yet it's in our control to a certain extent, right? Because we can take a deep breath in. Our singers use very fine control of their respiratory system to power voice in a very a uh, high level kind of way. The laryngeal system is located in the neck and that consists of our larynx or voice box 
And the name is a bit of a misnomer to an extent. We think of the voice box as producing voice. It does house the vocal folds, indeed, but the primary purpose of the larynx is to protect the lungs from foreign bodies and from aspiration during swallowing. It also allows us to cough and bear down, and we use the larynx a lot with exertion. And, um, and this is where the larynx lives. It can, consists of cartilage and soft tissues centrally in the neck. And you can all feel this here. And you'll feel a buzzing sound when you put your uh, hands on your larynx as you, make, as you generate sounds. And in tremor, you'll feel some abnormal movements in this area commonly. So within the larynx, there is a, a paired muscles that form the vocal folds. And the vocal folds are muscles with ligament and mucous membrane tissue attached to cartilages that are on a joint that allow the vocal folds to open when we're breathing. This is the windpipe down below. And when we're speaking, coughing, swallowing, the vocal folds come together. And as air passes through the vocal folds, they vibrate passively. And that vibration is kind of like clapping and sound is generated. And we can change the shape of our vocal folds to change the sounds that we make, whether it's pitch or quality. The longer and more stretched the vocal folds are, the higher pitch, the shorter the vocal folds are, the lower pitch. And this is a video, it's called a laryngeal video stroboscopy. This is a look-see through the mouth with a telescope that's looking down like a periscope onto the larynx and vocal folds housed right here in the neck. And you'll see this individual starting at a high pitch and then going down to a low pitch with special strobe light that shows how the vocal folds vibrate passively when air goes between them. It's quite beautiful. You see things are very stable. See the windpipe below. And these are vocal folds in motion. So moving on to the horn, if you will, that is everything above the vocal folds. And this is an anatomical diagram of all those structures. The throat, the mouth, the back of the nose, and then the nasal cavities. And here's another look from the back. It's quite complicated, uh, every bit or more complicated than our trumpet that I've depicted here on the right. And the end result, when the power source, our respiratory system, the sound generator, our larynx, and then our modifier, our horn above the vocal folds, when they work in concert, coordinated well by the brain, the results can be spectacular. I don't know if anyone else is a Celine Dion fan, uh, but I am. and. Um, and uh, the, the, the final result uh, really is quite impressive in terms of what we can do with our voice. Now, things um, happen that affect our ability to generate stable sounds. Uh, and what are those? How do voice disorders happen? So fundamentally, any disruption of the elements of voice production can lead to voice problems. Most of the time it's not pulmonary issues, but sometimes it is. Laryngeal problems and resonator problems. So the most common source of problems that we see when voice problems happen are indeed in the voice box and changes to the vocal folds. Symptoms of a voice disorder can be varied. We use the word hoarseness, which is a very generic term for voice change. Um, so persistent, Hoarseness, roughness to the voice, breathiness to the voice, vocal fatigue, so rapid decline in your ability to produce voice, decreased volume or voice projection, loss of control or stability to the voice, very salient for vocal tremor and laryngeal dystonia, loss of vocal range, and even neck and throat discomfort with voice use are a symptom of a voice disorder. So it can be a little bit varied. Now, voice disorders can be caused by a variety of different problems. And, um, 
and it requires some detective work uh, to sort this out so because good treatment starts with an accurate diagnosis and this just uh, this slide just depicts the smorgasbord of things that can lead to voice problems vocal fold polyps nodules or cysts which are benign conditions caused by vocal trauma muscle tension related issues acid reflux can lead to throat complaints that can have some secondary effects on the voice Vocal fold paralysis or weakness, paresis, changes voice quality and power. Scarring can develop from either surgery or sometimes trauma otherwise to the voice. Even intrinsic trauma like voice use, extensive voice use can lead to injury and scarring. The most important thing when voice changes that we need to evaluate for is tumors of the larynx. These can be benign, but they can be malignant as well. Um, and what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about today is spasmodic dysphonia and vocal tremor and their related conditions, which is why uh, we're including both in this discussion. So getting back to that, uh, the, my, my important statement about getting checked for voice problems. If you have voice problems or voice change that last longer, really we say two weeks, but our National Academy uh, guidelines indicate four weeks of voice change, get checked. And getting checked uh, is uh, painless and easy. Ear, nose, and throat doctors or otolaryngologists are the specialty to see for voice change. And having the larynx and throat looked at is a painless procedure that we do in the office with wide awake and um, it's quite straightforward. So uh, have no fear about getting checked for voice change. It's important. And now also importantly, voice care is a team sport. And I'm depicting our LA Dodgers here. The patient is the most important individual along with their loved ones, the center of this uh, team flower here. Our otolaryngologist and neurologist, commonly with speech language pathology, physical therapy and occupational therapy can play an important role. But functioning as a team with the patient as our center we can sort out and treat most conditions of voice to positive effect. Okay, so now let's dig into spasmodic dysphonia and vocal tremor. So these are some things that are common about both of them. So the what? When, you have, when people experience vocal tremor or spasmodic dysphonia, another word for spasmodic dysphonia is laryngeal dystonia. People experience abnormal involuntary, not in their control, movements of any of the areas of the vocal tract, commonly the larynx, but sometimes the throat, tongue, and palate, our horn. And this can lead to an unstable and unpredictable quality to the voice. And the severity of voice change that occurs with vocal tremor and spasmodic dysphonia can vary widely. Sometimes symptoms are very, very minor and no real treatment is, is needed. Sometimes it can be very severe and can impact people's ability to communicate in all domains of their life. Now, importantly, with spasmodic dysphonia and vocal tremor, these are neurological conditions of the brain and the larynx itself is normal. And that has uh, important implications for treatment. The cause is unknown. There's active research supported by the IETF and other important funding organizations to try to become more precise about what the cause is. And the areas of the body that can be affected with dystonia and tremor can be variable. Sometimes it is focal, meaning involving one specific site. An example of that would be spasmodic dysphonia. Sometimes it can involve an area an example of that would be vocal tremor, which involves commonly the larynx and the throat wall. Sometimes you can get a region involved where you get the entire head and neck involved with dystonia or tremor, and sometimes it can be more generalized. The spasmodic dysphonia and vocal tremor are relatively rare conditions, which is one of the reasons why our understanding of these conditions and research into our understanding and new treatments can be slow. Spasmodic dysphonia is estimated to occur in about one to 100,000 people. Vocal tremor is more common. Now, it, there's not 
many accurate reports on how common vocal tremor is, but we know that essential tremor is considerably more common than the dystonias, and vocal tremor lives within essential tremor. One thing that is uh, important to note, 30% of people with spasmodic dysphonia also have co-occurring tremor. So both are kind of happening at once, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Tremor can run in families, typically on the maternal side. Uh, and I'm going to say right up front here, there is effective treatment for both. So now let's listen to some voice example, examples. MTD means muscle tension dysphonia, and muscle tension dysphonia is a condition of abnormal muscle tension that is usually secondary to something that's happening underneath. And so muscle tension dysphonia occurs, increased tension occurs in all of these conditions. Vocal tremor are various types of spasmodic dysphonia. As we apply increased tension, in our area to try to stabilize movements that are happening outside of our control. So let's listen to this example of vocal tremor. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long brown arc with its path high above and its two, its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. Good, deep breath and a comfortable awe. Ah. How about like this? Ah. Uh, okay. Ah. Uh, so you hear that kind of irregular, unstable voice that became very obvious when this individual held out a prolonged sound. So now listen to let's listen to adductor type spasmodic dysphonia. Adductor ad means together. And the vocal cords in this condition are spasming together in, a, in an irregular kind of way. Let's take a listen. Uh, the blue spot is on the key again. How hard did he hit him? We were away a year ago. And, and the dystonias can have some variable presentations as well. Here's a more, what we call chronic constricted spasmodic dysphonia, where things are so tight, they're kind of continuously contracting. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arch with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. A dog dug a new bone. We mow our lawn all year. The waves were rolling along. 80, 81, 82, 83, 84. And you hear that very strained sound, and you can really perceive the amount of work that that individual is having to put in to generate voice. A more rare presentation of spasmodic dysphonia or laryngeal dystonia is called abductor. Ab means apart. And so in this situation, the vocal folds are spasming apart. And the voice becomes breathy and has breathy breaks. Listen. 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. One through 10? One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eighty to eighty-five. Eighty, eighty-one, eighty-two, eighty-three, eighty-four, eighty-five. Look up at the TV and give me good. Okay, and so you hear that voice almost dropping out or giving out in the middle of, of phrases. Again, in kind of an irregular kind of way. Unlike in Tremor, where we heard e -e 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 -e, a very rhythmic abnormal contraction. So despite the sound uh, being very abnormal in all of these conditions, the larynx itself is normal. Because that's because that's not where the problem is. So what's different between vocal tremor and spasmodic dysphonia is they sound different. And if you listen very carefully, we can detect these differences fairly readily. Tremor is quite regular. We hear it more with prolonged sounds and people can hide it better in free running speech. 
spasmodic dysphonia is very irregular and it occurs with certain phrases with the common type adductor spasmodic dysphonia that tends to occur with more vowel sounds we mow our lawn all year a dog dug a new bone with abductor spasmodic dysphonia the sounds occur more with consonant laden phrases like peter will keep at the peak Another important difference is we can see tremor, and this is important diagnostically because these can be hard diagnoses to make because the tissue in this area is, is generally normal. But we can see tremor when we do what's called laryngoscopy in the office, and I'll show an example of that because the abnormal movements are more uh, obvious and they occur in this regular kind of way. The age of onset is typically different in spasmodic dysphonia. Typically, individuals present with these voice changes in their 40s and 50s. And vocal tremor tends to occur later, uh, over age 60. And as we get older, there can be some age-related changes to the larynx that can co-occur with this as well. Singing, interestingly enough, is usually less problematic early in spasmodic dysphonia. And so that's one of the things we use diagnostically. People will say that my speaking is considerably worse than when I go to sing. I seem to sing more easily. This is an important slide as we talk about uh, how these conditions tend to occur together. I mentioned earlier that about a third of the time people with spasmodic dysphonia also have vocal tremor. And so there's two thoughts around this. One is that this is that vocal tre tremor and dystonia are all part of kind of one condition with different presentations, either irregular abnormal contractions of muscle in the dystonia side of things and very regular contractions in the tremor side of things with a spectrum in between or that they're two different distinct conditions that just tend to co-occur together commonly. We don't fully know. So how do we sort this out? How do we make this diagnosis? Well, we hope that people with voice change come in for evaluation, and then when they're in for evaluation, we do a detailed history so we can understand the story and what's happening with the patient in general and with the voice in particular. We do a head and neck examination, which consists of looking and feeling, and then most importantly, listening. And that we call a perceptual, vo perceptual voice evaluation. And we use a structured vocal capabilities battery with speaking, with speaking with certain phrases, with prolonged sounds, with, difference, with, with differences in pitch, high pitch and low pitch, differences in loudness and projection. Then we look. We look with a, with a simple painless office procedure called laryngoscopy, where we either pass a skinny little endoscope through the nose, and that allows us to look at the palate and then down to the back of the throat and take a look at the throat wall, the back of the tongue, the voice box, all the way down to where the esophagus and the trachea starts. And then we put these findings together to come up with our diagnosis. And having an accurate diagnosis is important because treatment is always built upon an accurate diagnosis. Now this slide uh, uh, highlights some important research that the, was funded by the National Institute of Health as part of a project called the Dystonia Coalition, which I was fortunate enough to be part of. And part of this uh, research included getting a wide variety of experts together to come up with some consensus on attributes that, can, that are commonly occur with spasmodic dysphonias, two common types, muscle tension dysphonia, and vocal tremor. And so we can use these to really educate people so we get better diagnosis uh, for folks who have these conditions. Okay, what's happening with vocal tremor? So I mentioned before, it's this rhythmic, regular, involuntary, oscill oscillatory movements of the muscles of voicing that change the that kind of that changes the, the uh, stability of sound. 
So let's take a look. This is that laryngoscopy that I mentioned where we're looking in the back of the nose and you're going to start seeing the structures of voicing starting with the palate and you're going to see these abnormal movements happen. Like I said, we can see tremor. Good, tell me. E. <laughs> Do it again. E. <laughs> you see the palate bobbing up and down. Now, now we're looking at me. the throat. Turn your head to the middle. And we can see the throat wall, we can see the voice box, and this is the back of the palate called the uvula. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Tell me E again. <laughs> you see how the whole voice box is shaking and some of the throat wall as again. well. <laughs> and that's very common in vocal tremor. The larynx is commonly involved as well as the throat wall. Up. Let me just look at your vocal cords. Breathe. Breathe. You can see the airway below. Breathe. And you see these tremulous movements happening. Okay. Sniff. And no surprise when your horn, if you will, is shaking, then the voice shakes along with it. It's important for treatment to recognize that vocal tremor typically involves multiple sites. Sp spasmodic dysphonia, on the other hand, typically involves just one site, typically the, the larynx and vocal folds. And these are irregular contractions uh, that are also involuntary movements that, cr that breaks up the voice in an irregular kind of way. Also can be very disabling for communication and being understood. Both have significant increased vocal effort. And this is a video of a laryngeal examination of a patient with spasmodic dysphonia. And you won't see the same findings as we do in tremor. It's not as obvious because the movements tend to be very quick and, um, and, and oftentimes in small amplitude or amount. Okay. Now let's do it loud. Good. Can we go low to high? Perfect. So if I were to show this video to um, people who are trained at looking at them, you wouldn't be able to tell from this video at all that this person has spasmodic dysphonia. That diagnosis is largely made on listening, that careful audio perceptual evaluation that we talked about previously. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about how spasmodic dysphonia and vocal tremor are treated. There are three main categories of treatment. Medical treatment, okay, this would be you know, pharmaceutical management. Voice therapy or behavioral interventions, okay, and then Botox injections. And we'll talk about each of these uh, briefly. Medical therapy is well known to be more effective for extremity tremors, tremors in the hand, than what we call axial tremors, tremors that are lined up along the body. And vocal tremor is one of those axial tremors that's lined up in the center of the body. But that being said, medical therapy is effective for, for vocal tremor to a certain extent. And when I became interested in this area, common teaching was that medical therapy doesn't work for vocal tremor. And, uh, and I felt that should be studied. And so we did a study comparing the effectiveness of, of propranolol and botulinum toxin for the treatment of essential voice tremor. And turns out about half of the people who got propranolol alone had improvements in their voice, not perfect, improvements in their voice. Now, the improvements weren't as great as those who received Botox injections. This is a crossover study, so everybody got both. And, um, but there was positive effect to medical therapy. So we don't discount medical therapy to treat vocal tremor. The common medications uh, that are used are propranolol, a medication called primidone. And these are usually prescribed by neurologists. And it's important to have a, a good neurologist on your team. Let's talk about behavioral treatment, voice therapy. So this is different ways to use your voice and speech. Now, voice therapy or speech therapy is, doesn't treat the primary condition. So it's not getting at the root cause of tremor or spasmodic dysphonia, 
but it can be helpful in terms of workarounds to a certain extent. So optimizing efficiency and method of voice production to reduce the severity of the instability. And so we commonly will apply voice therapy um, when it's needed. And the third core uh, treatment is, is indeed Botox injections. And Botox is botulinum toxin and it is a therapeutic that's injected locally into muscle and it weakens the muscles in which it's injected. And that's basically how it works. We listen and we look and we identify the tissue that is moving abnormally and then we inject Botox into that tissue to weaken it to create more stable voice. And this works particularly well for tremor and spasmodic dysphonia that has significant amounts of vocal cord involvement because we can very safely and effectively inject Botox into the true vocal cords or vocal folds, weaken them and really stabilize voice. I mentioned earlier that vocal tremor commonly involves the horn uh, of the instrument, if you will, uh, the throat wall, back of the tongue, palate. And those are areas that are harder to treat with Botox. And we typically don't treat those areas with Botox because they serve other important critical functions like eating and swallowing. And so it's, uh, uh, those areas are very challenging to treat. But sometimes muscles around the larynx can lead to shaking of the larynx and we can inject those muscles pretty safely. So by careful listening, by careful looking, and then artful application of medical therapy, behavioral therapy, voice therapy, and Botox injections, sometimes in combination, we can improve uh, people's quality of life as, as it pertains to their voice and improve their vocal effort, their fluency, their ability to be heard and ability to be understood. And now we have a variety of emerging treatments that I hope are going to be the cornerstone uh, as we get closer to treating really the root cause of these problems. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so I wanted to show, it can be kind of daunting, the idea of having a injection into your vocal cords or vocal folds. And so I thought it'd be worthwhile showing a video uh, with permission from my patient about how we do this. And it's quite simple uh, in principle. Uh, a skinny needle is passed through the neck skin into the vocal fold muscle, and then a small amount of Botox is injected. Now it can be tricky to find these small muscles. And so we use technology to help us. And here you see these sticky pads that are applied to the skin. And that's connected to a machine that allows us to use technology called electromyography. And electromyography allows us to um, localize these muscles, these small muscles more accurately. And so you'll hear the clicking of the EMG machine during this video. Let's watch. Just a tiny bit? Yes, perfect. E. Perfect. That's it. And so that's a patient with vocal tremor. And when you listen for the, the kind of the clicking sound, you'll hear the, the regular. Let's listen to that again. Perfect. That's it. Yeah. And so they're, they're, no, one, no one does this for fun, but it's tolerated. And, uh, and it is effective. And so here's an example of our, uh, the voice of the individual who you heard earlier. The rainbow is a division of bright light into many beautiful colors. Each takes the shape of a long brown arc with its path high above and its two, its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. And now after? The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape 
of a long, round arch with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. And so you can hear the improvement in the instability and the tightness, that tight sound to the voice, and you get a sense of how there's less effort being put in to produce voice after Botox treatment. So these are effective. It, is, it requires a lot of good communication between clinician and patient with artful injection and dosing of Botox to optimize results. So this really is where the science and art of medicine intersect. All right, well, I'm gonna, gonna uh, focus on the, the last part of this session on what treatments are being explored. There's lots of, uh, we have treatments that are available but as you see, there's limitations because we don't really understand the root cause and we don't have treatment that's directed towards the root cause. And I think this is the direction that we're going. Uh, currently, the, uh, there are some uh, uh, behavioral treatments that are being explored. And this is from the university, work from the University of Minnesota looking at vibrational strategies. This is an external device that basically vibrates the laryngeal tissues, which changes their behavior. And they are exploring this treatment of noticed positive effects in people with spasmodic dysphonia uh, from this treatment that were fairly short lived. But it's promising that, that this could be a non-invasive treatment that could uh, lead to some relief. There is a study that is ongoing uh, about a medication called sodium oxabate uh, uh, being applied in spasmodic dysphonia. Sodium, uh, sodium oxabate is marketed under the name Xyrem, and this tends to be effective in these pilot studies for people who have alcohol responsive dystonia. Some people note that, oh, when I have a glass of wine or a beer, my voice really clears up. And, and this it has some similar effects to that. Now, having, al having a glass of wine or beer is not a, a viable treatment uh, for work, for general living in life. And so that's why it's not um, recommended. Um, and so there's some promise here, but the problem is that this medication also has some side effects of, of kind of that alcohol-related intoxication. Um, but there may be some promise in medical treatments as well. Uh, I got all this information from looking at clinicaltrials.gov just to see what is, which is a wonderful uh, clearinghouse for research that's being done in the United States. And people were looking at a medicine called dextromethorphan, and that's a medicine that's in common cough syrups. And I've had some patients personally say they've had maybe some slight benefit. I've had patients say that didn't make a difference at all when they take it. This is, um, there's really no publications on this. So I think a, a study was started and, um, and there were not much significant findings from this. But here are some of the newer treatments that are, are being done. And this is a work and slides to be credited to Teresa Jacobson uh, Kimberly, who is at uh, Mass General Hospital and is leading this research called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is a minimally invasive way where there is a magnetic field that is targeted to certain areas of the brain to try to alter that brain activity. And the positives around this is it's very minimally invasive and, um, and it's unclear whether this will lead to some promising results, but I certainly hope so. Pilot research is showing some potential. Um, the uh, deep brain stimulation is commonly talked about and is being used for severe cases of vocal tremor and Parkinsonism and some other neurological conditions. And this is where a probe is placed into specific areas of the brain. And those brain areas are then stimulated in a, a scientific way to reduce symptoms of tremor, Parkinsonism, dystonia. And um, the, uh, there, there is promise and there's evidence this is very, very helpful. 
Now, it's not at the level of precision for people with isolated voice problems to be a routinely applied treatment. And there are significant complications from brain surgery, um, as you might imagine. But this technology is going to continue to improve and become more precise and have less risks and side effects. So hopefully there will be some promise at getting to the root causes in the brain for the treatment of spasmodic dysphonia and vocal tremor. And this is just a quick slide on showing some quality in terms of voice related quality of life uh, that demonstrated significant improvements in this individual or one single individual with DBS off versus on. Um, getting back to electrical stimulation, the prior pilot study that I described where the, the researchers are working on external stimulation of the larynx, Michael Pittman is working on internal stimulation of the laryngeal muscles. And he has found in his pilot studies some promising results by, by passing these are what's called hooked wire electrodes or basically wires directly into the larynx and then electrical activity stimulation is applied to the muscles that are involved it is part of a protocol and then there's some positive effects that result and so this is pilot work that's being done but ultimately if there is significant is there's significant safety and efficacy could potentially lead to an implantable type device that could be uh, put in uh, to lead to, to uh, significant improvements. And so that's uh, my brief overview of spasmodic dysphonia and vocal uh, tremor, what it is, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what are the common treatments that we apply today, and what things may be on the horizon. But in the meantime, it is it, it's important to emphasize that this is a team activity and the patient's the most important, but it requires coordinated work between neurology, ENT or laryngology, speech pathology, and our colleagues in physical therapy and occupational therapy. And so with that, I thank you for joining and I hope this was helpful to you. Take care. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Johns. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today and share some information on vocal tremor. I especially found the information on new potential treatment options to be fascinating. And I know the ET community, like every other disorder, is always looking for new and better treatment options for whatever the disorder is. So that's some exciting information. Uh, we hope everyone found this presentation helpful and hopefully you learned something new today. If you have any questions regarding Essential Tremor, please visit the IETF website at EssentialTremor.org, or you can call us toll-free at 888-387-3667. Finally, if you're a donor to the IETF, we thank you for your support. If you aren't currently a donor, we hope you could consider a gift to help us continue the work we do promoting ET awareness, education, support, and research. We're going to be hosting a variety of uh, virtual ET education events in the upcoming months. So look for notices about these events in your email, our social media, and our Tremor Talk magazine. So thank you again for joining us today, Dr. Johns and everyone out there. And we hope that you have a great day.